Hey there, it's Andrea, and welcome to the Voice of Influence podcast. Today, I have with me Michael Levin, who is a New York Times bestselling author and ghostwriter. And we, I'm excited to have this conversation with you, Michael, about ghostwriting and what you do um, and, you know, the publishing industry and thought leadership and all this kind of stuff. So um, it's nice to meet you and welcome to the Voice of Influence podcast. Andrea, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So you have written a lot. You have been doing this for a long time. Can you tell us a little bit about like, okay, why ghostwriting? Like, how'd you get into ghostwriting in the first place? I backed into it. I was a lawyer by training, worked in a couple of law firms. Uh, I didn't like it. They didn't like me. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was unemployable after two firms, basically. One almost fired me. The second did fire me, sat me down. You know, news is not good. Uh, and I, I, fortunately, I had sold three novels to Simon & Schuster at the same time. And I could not sell a fourth, ran out of money, became a literally starving writer. I uh, met a mentor. He told me to open up writing classes, private classes. I did. I was teaching at the same time in the writing programs at UCLA and NYU. So I had a little credibility that in the Simon & Schuster books. So the classes filled and more classes and more classes. And people started saying, write it for me. And uh, first coach me and then write it for me. So I literally backed into ghostwriting. And if you add up all the books that I've done and I have, uh, either uh, that I've either written, edited, ghostwritten, my team has written, co-authored, uh, planned, agented in some cases and so on. It's over a thousand books in 35 years. Wow. So, yeah. So there you have it. In a nice yeah. Way. That's a lot. That's a lot of messages to get out there. It's a lot of, it's a lot of understanding other people's perspective and communicating that in a way that's authentic to that person. That's exactly right. There's a, there's a page on my website that has nine excerpts from nine books from nine different clients. And they are men, women, black, white, Asian, young, old, business people, sports figures, um, uh, memoirs, just just to demonstrate the range. And it's it's so it's a combination of listening, writing, and mimicry. Because when you ghost, if you're doing it right, um, you're not writing in the other person's voice. You're being the other person as if you mm -hmm. were a client. And as client, you're you're you know, you're speaking the way they speak. Uh, you're, you're, you're using their uh, syntax, their word choice, their sentence length. You're being mm. them. Mm. And it sometimes takes a couple of chapters before we're completely in sync on how the client wants to sound and print. But then once they do, you know, um, it's really fun. So that's the basics. It's such an art form. I mean, the ability to even figure it out in the first place, let alone to continue it for, you know, 350 pages or whatever whatever is in the book. I mean, that, that it's got to be a discipline as well. I am so curious about the process because I know that part of what people are looking for when they're thinking about writing a book, but they're not sure if they can write a book, um, is how do you, how do you maintain authenticity when, you know, you're, you're using a ghostwriter? Sure. Uh, well, the authenticity question, I have a lawn. I do not mow my lawn. But if you ask whose lawn is that, they'll say, that's Michael's lawn. Okay. So to, in prosaic terms, that's kind of how it is with ghostwriting. I don't do my own taxes. Um, my wife loves to cook. I don't. There are a lot of things I don't do that have my name on. And the reality is that I'm just simply here not to put ideas in your head or words in your mouth. I'm here to uh, facilitate the dissemination of your ideas in your voice. Yeah. And it's a book. So is it by you? Of course it is, because this is your thinking. These are your ideas that you've taken decades to develop. And I'm just here to make sure that it sounds right as a book. And for most pe people, writing their own book is not the highest and best use of their time, even if they enjoy writing, and a lot of people don't. The thing is that pay time, people ought to be out there selling and doing and serving and all the things that, that we business people do, uh, as a, or doctors or wh whatever they are not locked away, uh, you know, putting words on a page. And, uh, you know, typically you see in books where people wrote it themselves. I want to thank my spouse and children for, for putting up with my disappearance. Well, who wants that? <laughs> you know, unless you don't like your wife and children or your husband. And children. <laughs> now, in that case, thank God I got to do this book because I didn't have to see them for nine months. But all I'm saying is that for most people, it's just not the highest misuse of their time to do their book themselves. Why go up that learning curve? 
when you can have somebody else get it done for you. Mm. So when you start the process, do you mind if I ask a couple process questions? Because I'm so curious. That's good. I'm yeah. I, I love talking about this. I could talk about it all day. So yeah. Right. Follow. How do you initially understand what the other person is trying to say, what the author is trying to say? Um, in particular, I guess, I mean, I'm sure they have some sort of like summary that they're sharing, but I'm sure that you are really good at like digging in and getting getting into the nitty gritty. So what does that process kind of look like? Sure. And it takes an hour to 90 minutes to do the planning for the book. And this means getting the title, the subtitle, chapter titles, the overall flow of information from the author to the reader. And at the same time, the starting point, most writers make a big mistake right out of the gate. They focus on what should the content of this book be? What should this book be about? And the real question, this is where I begin, is asking essentially, whom are we trying to influence? A book is a tool of influence cleverly disguised as a book. And you are trying to reshape the molecules in the reader's brain so that the reader came in not thinking about the topic and now they're thinking the way you want them to think about it, or they were thinking about it some other way and now they're thinking the way you want them to think. So you are influencing them. So the question becomes, who are you trying to influence? Where are they now? And where do you want to take them? And, and so we just sort of discuss that. We go back and forth and I'm listening. Oh, that sounds like a chapter. That sounds like a chapter. And I'm sort of messing around and creating a table of contents that a day or two later they have in their inbox. Like, that looks like magic. How'd you get that out of that call? And the first question that I like to ask is what I call the Oprah question because it puts people at their ease. I say, hi, I'm Oprah. Welcome to my show. Tell the audience why you wrote the book. And they're like, oh. <laughs> and then they, I don't mean to imitate all of my clients, but they're like, oh, yeah. And then they just kind of go with it. And then we just, we just go from there because they like the idea of being on Oprah's couch yeah. and it's sort of like the ultimate dream, but that's, you know, they get that and that kind of puts them at their ease. And then they're able to talk about that. When you talk about why you wrote the book, you're not talking about the content. You're talking about the book as a tool of influence. You're talking about, well, I wanted to do X, Y, Z. You know, I mean, I do a lot of business books do a lot of memoirs. I did a book last year for a woman. It's a, you know, it's a pretty horrific story. She was sex trafficked and she was a suburban mom. And the guy who had put her into this thing basically on, on weekends basically said, if, uh, if you, if you try to get out of this, we're going to tell everybody who you are and what you do. And she lives in a, you know, in a religious community, uh, you know, so this would have been just disaster for her and her family. And somehow she got out and now she speaks in front of 25,000 people and at conferences and tells her story to help other people get out of the same predicament. And so, you know, so, so there, this is a book that is a tool of influence for a person who is putting her experience uh, out there for the benefit of the reader. Mm -hmm. And this is why I say books are not, at least the books that, 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 that my company does uh, are not, um, they're not ego or vanity driven. They're sir, they're acts of service. You've been doing what you've been doing forever, and now you're going to put it on paper so that other people can benefit. Some of them are going to pick up the phone and call you and hire you. Others will simply read the book and have a better financial life, better personal life, better business life because of what you've showed them. And you'll get the karma points kind of indirectly. You'll get them. Uh, but the main thing is you're out there trying to make other people's lives better. So it's not ego. It's not vanity. I mean, it's fun. But the thing is that I, I see a book as a tool of influence and an act of service, and mm -hmm. no matter who the audience is. Mm. Yeah. So once you kind of have that sense of, okay, so these are the chapters, mm -hmm. how do they figure out what they're going to put in them? How do you figure out what you're going to put in them? Well, we both look at the table of contents and we just go through the, the uh, I, I need an hour per chapter. If I can get, if I can get an hour of your time once a week, we can have, uh, let's say for 10 to 12 weeks. I can get 12 to 15 pages of book out of an interview, out of a one hour interview. So, uh, we're, so in 10 to 12 weeks, we, in 12, which is 10 to 12 hours of your time, we will have a hundred to 150 page manuscript, which translates to a book that's hundred to 150 pages, which is kind of optimal today. Mm. People's attention spans have shriveled because of social media and technology. So it's basically no longer biggest book wins. Instead, it's say what you have to say and then get off the stage. <laughs> And that's what the readers like. So you give me an hour and 
within two weeks, I'll be giving you a chapter in your inbox and you're going to, oh, now I understand. Okay, I get it. And that gives you confidence for the next hour conversation or for the rest of them because you know that all you have to do is just kind of talk about stuff and it's, it's my job, it's our job on my end to put all that stuff together so that it has a sense of flow, beginning, middle, and end, and it reads like a chapter. And, uh, you know, wash, rinse, wash, rinse repeat. And then we can publish it for you. We can, we can get the marketing done for you if you want. So, you know, it, I wow. like to say I only work with people who are too busy to talk to me. If you're not that busy, you don't need a book. If you are that busy, how are you <laughs> going to get it done? And that's why we have this process that yeah. enables busy business people and busy people generally to get their books done. Hmm. I mean, it it sounds so easy. It's it's interesting because I sometimes it better be. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Something like that. I'm still figuring it out. You know, I'm waiting. Sure, I'm sure. I mean, I I think one of the things that is fun about doing a podcast is that people have lots to they have lots to say, and even sometimes I'm inter interviewing CEOs. Sometimes I'm inter interviewing thought leaders and business owners who are, have a message that they're trying to get out, but Sometimes it's just like a CEO that has their own day job that this is just a, about leadership and business problems and such. But um, but even those people have they have so much to say when they're asked the right questions. Yes. And if and if you're interviewing for the for a book and you and, and, and you do a good job, uh, you might only ask four or five questions in the hour. Mm. You know, others kind of like a more rat attack back and forth style but typically just just open the door and let them go oh man <laughs> that's great no you you'd mentioned that it's important to have a a smaller book now than it used to be that sort of thing um attention spans and all that um do you ever find that there are certain people that have that feel like they have more to say and they're struggling with you know should this be one book or two books or that sort of thing yeah, very much so. I was just on the phone with the, or a Zoom call with a prospect just prior to recording this podcast. He was saying, I want to do two books. I said, great. What are they? He, he told me what they are. And I said, well, they really need to be one book. You know, I mean, you could do it as one book. And I'm, I'm talking myself out of getting a two book deal with you. But the reality is that what you call book three, he had done book one already. What you call, you know, the, the second of these two books really sounds like the first half of the first one. And, and, the, and then the, the ne then what you were going to do next sounds like the second half of this one book. And he's like, really? He said, you know, we, I, I like, make me the case that they must be two books. And he said, well, you know, I think this and that. So part of a good ghost's role is to stand up firmly, but gently to the client, politely and courteously. And at the same time say, I'm not going to let you drive this off the cliff. I'm not going to let you put things into the book that are going to be detrimental. And if if you don't need two books and we can do it as one, then then based on my experience doing this, I'm going to suggest you do it as one. Hmm. A lot of ghosts are not only afraid of their clients because they're successful, but um, depending on how they were educated, uh, they may hate business. There, are, I mean, young people today are taught basically at the university level to hate business mm -hmm. and to think that business is bad. At the same time, they love their iPhones, they love their Starbucks. They love their Lululemon, uh, but uh, they hate business. I go, what? So the thing is that, you know, you've got to be very careful. Does If you're choosing a ghostwriter, does your writer have a built-in unconscious bias against business and business people? And if so, you know, uh, they're not the right person. And I'm not going to sit here and hold a brief for the business community and say, well, they've never done anything wrong or anything like that. Right. That's certainly not true. The thing is that... Uh, you know, if you don't see business as a force for good, then don't cash a check from a business person for, for writing their book hmm. and, and have the courage to say, and then at the same time, you know, you can't be afraid of them. You've got to be able to say, that's going to be detrimental, or that's not a story that we need to tell. I'm a lawyer by training. I, I have a libel, you know, yep. red light in my head that goes, I said, can you know, we can't say that. And they're like, yeah, you're right. I can imagine that the people that you're talking to, the people that you're helping write these books, that while they have a lot to say and they have maybe a high powered career, there's still, a, there's still some, I don't know, vulnerability or, you know, they're putting themselves in your hands. So being able to trust you is pretty important. Yes. And it, it's, it's essential. I mean, they're, 
there has to be trust on so many levels. First, the confidentiality issue. I've been doing this for yeah. you know, five years. I've never had a breach of confidentiality. So that's the first thing. If you, if you look me up online, you won't find anything negative about me. Why? It's because you know, I do a good job and, and, uh, and if I mess up, I make it right as quickly as possible. Um, so so you, just on a basic level, there has to be trust. But, you know, it's, it, 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 it just as uh, people will sometimes tell their uh, financial advisors that they're getting divorced you know, before they've told their spouse. Um, people tell me things that they've never told anybody. And twice it's happened that people have written checks to Dr. Levin because you know, they found it so therapeutic. I'm not a doctor. I'm a typist. But yeah, you know, but the, 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 the trust comes. The trust comes, I think, because um, I'm a good listener. You know, that's really what it comes down to. It's, it's my ability to listen is what convinces people that, that I'm the right person uh, uh, to work with because listening is, is, is very rare today. It's very rare that anybody listens to anybody. When other people are talking, we're just sort of like waiting for them to stop so we can say what we say next. And, and when you're actually listened to, it's kind of a high. You know, it's a really neat feeling and it's not something you get every day. So people really like the fact that I can listen carefully, courteously. And then sometimes people say, well, you know, what about AI? Why don't you just use AI? AI cannot hear the things that you want to say, but you're not quite saying. Mm. AI cannot recognize when you're saying something that no one else in the industry is saying. Yeah. And that's something I can recognize because I've either read all the books in your field or I wrote a lot of them, you know, because I've been doing this for so long. So, so I like to say it's not AI, it's you and I. And you and I are going to have a great time together because we're just going to play pitch and catch. We're just going to, we're just going to talk and listen and it's going to be great. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. You know, we do, um, in the process of like consulting, we'll do focus groups sometimes or, or even after a meeting, um, we have to summarize or we, we do summarize the input of the group. And being able to do that in a way that people feel heard and, you know, like distilled, like I'll oftentimes leave a meeting that feels really chaotic, but then I come back with, okay, this is what we, what we actually said. This is what was actually, what actually happened. And people are like, oh yeah, that is what we said. Huh. You know, and they breathe this sigh of a relief. So I'm sure that when it comes to getting their, their ideas out there or their story out there, that it's a similar thing to have somebody make some sense out of what they've said and still feel like, yeah, that is what I said. It's a big deal. What I'm said, and it sounds like me. Mm -hmm. And typically with my clients, we begin with what I call a test drive, where we do the book plan of the first two chapters for a smaller amount, and then they can make the decision, do I go forward or not? Okay. You know, because it is a lot. I mean, it's, it's not cheap. Um, I don't compete on price. I've been doing this long enough and, you know, people, there's a reason why people pay me what they pay me. But uh, you have to see for yourself. You know, you can't just, some of the people say, have you ever written a book like mine that I can see? Like I said, and I always say to them, if I had written a book like yours, there'd be no reason to do yours, you know? So, so the short answer is that I've never done a book like yours because exactly like yours, because I don't know you, I don't know your ideas. I don't know your thinking. And so I have to demonstrate my ability to listen and to hear and to be able to turn what you give me into a solid chapter and solid manuscript. And then, and then at the same time, you have to trust that, that, uh, that, that, that I am going to listen to you and hear you hear exactly what you're saying and exactly what you wish you could be saying, draw that out of you. And then you're going to see it on a page and you go, oh, wow, this is really good. When does it make sense for someone to kind of pursue a more traditional publishing deal versus going the independent or self-publishing route? What are yeah. your thoughts on that? You know, it makes sense to publish, to, 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 to go to New York. If your first name is Brittany and your last name is Spears, if your first name is Prince and your last name is Harry, you know, if your first name is Michelle and your last name is Obama, and you can't have one out of two, you got to have two out of two. I mean, New York, <laughs> you know, New York is no longer interested in the quality of the content. They're interested in your marketing plan and how mm. famous you are. So there, you have to have three out of three of the following. You have to be on network television weekly, like the baby doctor on the Today Show. You have to have a massive social media following and you have to be doing 50 keynotes a year in front of a major keynotes. And if you're not doing all three, then forget it. New York's not going to touch you. And it doesn't matter. You know, you put in your book plan, I'm happy to do a book tour. I'm like, get out of town, you amateur. And also, 
Um, you, you only do it. You only try to get a book deal with New York if your pl business plan is to sell a ton, a ton of books. If you're going to use your book for thought leadership, for marketing, for sales, you put it on your website for free and uh, give it out. You know, give it out to your 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 prospects. Give it to your influence influencer friends, your accountants, your attorneys who are able to uh, pass it along to relevant people. Uh, and New York can smell that a mile away. Their attitude is, we're not here to help you build your brand. When you have a fully realized brand, uh, like a Prince Harry or like a Meghan Markle, we'll talk. So New York is, is, is it's, it's out of reach. But the thing is that it's not necessary. Independent publishing, it's not, you know, your grandfather's uh, 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 self-publishing. Today, the books are just as beautifully physically designed and, and, and printed as books from Simon & Schuster and Rand, because it's the same printers. Your book goes up on Amazon the same way any, but any, anyone does from, you know, HarperCollins or, or, or Holt or something like that. Um, and better still, you keep all the money if you sell it back of the room, whereas Simon & Schuster will keep, you know, most of it, uh, most of the profit. Um, uh, and, and on Amazon, you'll keep half instead of 10 to 15 percent, instead of getting just 10 to 15 percent with a New York publisher. You control the timing. Let's say that you put your book out and then two months later, something happens in your industry, which really shakes things up. Or you hear something, gee, that ought to be in the book. You can put a second edition out that week. Right. And we're never going to let you do that. Uh, it, you can basically tack on a year to 18 months if you're going to go with New York. And they're going to they're going to tell you this is what the cover is going to look like. You, you're an author. What do you know about covers? We're publishing us. We know all about it. So the control, the money, and the time are all yours with independent publishing, and they're not yours with New York. So if they're going to back up the truck because you're Sully and you just landed a plane on the Hudson, or you're, if any people remember that, or if, you know, if you're Britney Spears and, you know, and you dated Justin Timberlake and everybody wants to know about that, why they want to know about that, I have the slightest idea, but I'm not the market. Go to New York. Anybody else, go independent, and you'll be uh, super happy that you did. Good points. Um, so when when somebody works with you and uh, they're in, you're in the writing process, take us from kind of that point of okay, you're meeting with them weekly and you're you're sending back chapters. I assume that there's some a little bit of back and forth. After that, and then and then what happens with publishing and all that? So can you yeah. share with us that part of it? Yeah. I mean, once we get the whole manuscript, we both read it top to bottom, just make sure we're happy, anything else we want to add. I call this the Bermuda Triangle of books because this is when clients get distracted. They get fearful. What are the critics going to say? There are no critics. Focus on the people you're going to help, not these imaginary beings who are going to, you know, you, you, you know your third grade teacher is not going to, like leap out of the grave and tell you what a bad book you did, you know, <laughs> let it go. <laughs> but then uh, all we do in-house is the ghostwriting. And okay. then at that point, I have vendors whom I trust who uh, do a phenomenal job of publishing and marketing books. And this means the cover design, the interior design, the layout, the ISBN number, the barcode, the copyright, the back cover copy, the blurbs, the photo, putting it up on Amazon, and putting it on Barnes and Barnes and Noble dot com, I have uh, a distributor. I have one who can distribute your books uh, through Simon and Schuster, since so it's Simon and Schuster distribution in your book. Distribute into physical bookstores if you need it. Most people don't need it. I have two vendors who can put it into airport bookstores, which is huge because uh, you know your your clients are walking past gate gate K twelve at O'Hare and they're in Barbara's Bookshop or whatever it's called. There's your book in the window. I tell my clients bring copies. And as you're going, as you're changing planes, uh, just, you know, leave a couple of books in the window of the bookstore. They won't notice and uh, then you have to pay any money. But the, the reality is that I can make, I can make the legitimately happen for you so that you've got the, you're not going to make money having books in a bookstore uh, just from selling them, but there's no better advertisement for you or your company. It's, it's a heck of a billboard. People go by, like, well, that looks interesting. Even if they don't buy the book, they've, it's made an impression. And then, and then, or they might take a picture of the book and then they, uh, and then they call you. So a lot of ways to, and then in terms of marketing, I've got, when it comes to publishing and marketing, there's so many people out there who will take such terrible advantage of first time authors. It's really just, and, and ghostwriting too, all of it. It's really, really shocking. I got into this, as I said, I backed into it because I love books and other people recognize, Hey, we can make a lot of money at this. And they do. 
And it's you know, good for them, but bad for the client because, you know, you're getting ripped off mercilessly in terms of what they're charging you and what they're delivering in terms of the quality of the ghostwriting, the quality of the publishing, quality of the marketing. So, you know, one of the companies uh, that I, a friend of mine, <laughs> friend of mine worked for one of them and then they fired her when they, when the company got sold, they brought a project manager in at like a third of her salary. I had never seen a book in his life. And so I flew her to California and debriefed her for two days because I wanted to understand exactly what I'm in this company. And I'm certainly not going to name it. And I would boil down what she told me to um, an under, un, an over, under, under strategy, uh, over promise, underperform. And when the client calls to complain, hide under the desk. So. You know, this is kind of what you're up against if you're a first-time author. And, you know, my clients trust me to put them in the hands of people who will do an outstanding job of the publishing and distribution. And then on the marketing side, get them what they need so that after they've spent the money on marketing, they got the results they wanted instead of just simply having nothing to show for it, which is all too often the case. Oh, I'm I'm sure. I'm sure that besides the fact that you have all this experience and you also care about the people that you're working with. I love my clients. I love them. I find them fascinating. I call my job the greatest grad school in the history of the world because the people who are the best at what they do are paying me to learn from them. Yeah. So, you know, they're getting a book out of it and I'm getting an education and <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. So. Do you have any interesting stories that you can share about some books that you've probably you've been a part of? I could tell you story after story about. I mean, I, I've, I, you know, I, I worked with uh, I worked with Dave Winfield on a book, and uh, I got to go to go to games with Dave, and you know, he's a baseball Hall of Famer and the only athlete drafted by MLB, NFL, and the NBA, and uh, we've stayed friends. Um, oh gosh. You know, I, I'm just, I'm just constantly, I'm just constantly learning and growing as a result of uh, my clients. I did a memoir for an individual who grew up in the Bronx and he was in the seventies. He's since passed in his late eighties. He passed a couple of years ago. Lovely, lovely man. And he became not just a client, but a mentor and a, and a very dear friend. And, uh, um, I always think about him in the sales process, because if you take sales training as I did, they, they talk about the rapport phase. And that's where, you know, oh, is that you're selfish? You know, whatever on the wall. Okay, great. Let's get down to business. And it's kind of fake and boring. So um, my client wanted, he was in real estate and he and his partner wanted to buy a particular piece of land from a seller who had no interest in selling. And they finally, finally, finally got a meeting and they get there and he's not the nicest guy in the world. He says, okay, yeah, I've got 45 minutes and then I got to fly. And I don't even know why you came up here. I'm not selling the property. What do you have to say? So my guy says, he says, I bet I paid less for my hair plugs than you did. And his partner is like, oh, my God, we just destroyed any shot. So he said, I'll take that bet. How much do you want to bet? He said, $100. So they both wrote down on a piece of paper how much they paid for their hair plugs. And my guy won. I don't so we spent 40, 40 minutes talking about hair plugs. And then 40 minutes into the meeting, the guy looks at his watch and says, well, you know, I got to leave in five minutes. I got to catch a flight. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to buy the property, I'll sell it to you. Let's just do it. So, you know, it's like everything that you've ever heard about the rapport phase should be like two to three minutes and then get on with it. Totally blown out of the water. So I get lost in the rapport phase of a call when I'm talking to a prospect. <laughs> They're like, aren't you going to tell me about how we do books? I'm like, oh, I forgot all, I forgot all about that. So <laughs> it's, it's like, you just, you just, you know, you just learn. So, okay. so the guy is on a, this is another real estate billionaire and he's on a flight and uh, they're going somewhere and uh, it's like skiing season. So they're there and there's snow and the flight is, is delayed and then it's canceled. And it's under, yeah, it's just a big mess. And there are 230 people standing there. And my guy stands up on one of the chairs in the uh, terminal right by the gate and starts yelling at the top of his lungs, Delta S word, Delta verb meaning like a vacuum cleaner. And before long, all 230 people are chanting, don't, don't, you know, like a whole crew. And then they, they won't stop. And they finally rolled out a plane just so that they would stop. And they got them out of there. So, <laughs> you know, so uh, these people don't take no for an answer. And uh, you just sort of, you go, wow, that's why he's, this, he put himself through USC playing poker. And, uh, and then he went on to a magnificent real estate career. So, 
you know, you just, you just you just meet the most interesting people and you're just learning fun stuff. You know, you you've learned so much. So I'm I'm wondering through this process, have you learned anything in particular or taken in anything in particular that kind of made a fundamental shift in like you and who you are and how you how you do life or business? Yeah, for sure. I I I I've done multiple books over the last 15 years with an individual who is one of America's top grief counselors. Mm. And he actually lost his daughter in, a, in, a, in, a, in an accident. She was overseas and she got killed in a bus accident. And uh, uh, he, he's brought in, you know, after Flight 800 or Newtown or 9-11 to talk to the families. And um, he accompanies the, uh, the parents to the morgue when, God forbid, a child had been killed. And they can't, you know, he can't do that by themselves. He, he goes into the morgue with the parents. I mean, who does that? So just, you know, being in his presence and we become very, very dear. We were, we're, we're brothers. I mean, we, you know, we were absolute brothers at this point after, especially after five books. I don't, I don't even remember. Um, but it just, it, you know, you, you meet somebody like that and it just sort of makes you raise your game in life. And you just sort of say, why, well, what am I doing here? And for me, you know, ghosting, Initially, sort of like this is really kind of distasteful. Um, I went on Shark Tank uh, as, a, as another story, and uh, and they did, sort of did an intervention on me. And they say, like, no, 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 what you're doing is really good, and you're the well, you know you're the you're the one point oh 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 one percent of writers who ever made a living out of uh, what you do. Um, so that sort of took the stigma out. And then I and, and then you know I, I sort of did the math, and I realized I only do books with positive people, positive messages. That's the qualification. And, and, and if you add up all the books and all the, and, and all the copies and all the lives, those, you know, these are millions and there are millions and millions of people out there who have better lives today, whether it's financial or personal or body, mind, spirit, or uh, psychological or health or whatever it is, uh, because of the work that, that I've been fortunate enough to do, as I said, disseminating the ideas of really smart, successful people who just wanted to, you know, who wanted a book as a force multiplier. Mm. So. You know, that's, I guess that's pretty good day at the office, you know, yeah. so, you, know you have to do something with your life and, 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 and working with that gentleman, just, it, it, you just constantly ask, can I raise my game? Mm. You know, I, I couldn't, he does, but could I, could I be a better version of me? So Michael, what else do you want to tell the listeners about if somebody is thinking about potentially writing a book or thinking about a ghostwriter, how can they find you? How can they find your business? Sure. I'm going to give you two websites, and uh, one is my book writing website, which is Michael Levin Writes. Uh, my website, yeah, MichaelLevinWrites.com. My name L E V I M, and MichaelLevinWrites.com. If they're a financial advisor, they should look at, or a wealth manager, they should look at Advisor Ghost. And if you want to do a book without me, you just want to do it. I have a course online at the best. It's called Best Earning Author, the Best Earning Author System, and it's at BestEarningAuthor.com. There are a lot of ways to become a best-selling author. Uh, you can buy it. You can cheat the system. Yeah. Two national. I mean, I have two legitimate New York Times bestsellers and 23 or so, maybe more, uh, legitimate national bestsellers and a bunch of number one bestsellers. But there are a lot of people who can get, you know, who can buy you bestseller status. And, and, and it's a good emblem to have, but it's not all it's cracked up to be. I want you to be a best-earning author. And I have a course that teaches everything I know about organizing, writing, uh, publishing, marketing, distributing, and and best best of all, monetizing your book. And that's at bestearningauthor.com. And I'm going to give your folks my cell number, which is 617-543-3747. I'll say it again. That's 617-543-3747. Operators are not standing by that's my <laughs> cell phone. I will... With so if you're that serious, then call me and we'll talk. And you can find out more about what I do and what my company does at those Michael Levin Writes, Advisor Ghost, and Best Earning Author. And uh, come on down. That's great. All right, I've got one more question for you. We'll make sure to post all that in the show notes. Um, one last question would be, uh, so this is the Voice of Influence podcast. What last piece of advice yes. do you have for somebody who wants to have a Voice of Influence? Fly your freak flag. Uh, be who you are and uh, stand up for what you personally believe in as opposed to trying to be a generality that everybody will find um, homogenous and okay. Uh, 
there, there, there are not a lot of people who are just willing to take a stand and say, this is what I believe in. This is who I serve. Uh, this is my approach. And this is what I, and, and this is what I do. And this is how I can help you. Most people are just, they're just trying, it's, it's sort of like a, you know, like a high school prom. They're just trying not to offend and, and, and hoping that somehow somebody will dance with them. And what I'm saying is uh, you, have a, you have a unique approach to whatever it is that you do. No one else has that approach. No one else has your background. Your, your, no one else grew up in your home and, and went on to do what you do, unless your sibling does. But you're it. And you're not going to be able to help everybody. No one can help everybody. But the thing is that you are the right person for your tribe, as Seth Godin puts it. You're the right person for the people who, who have a pain or a problem that only you can take away. And so you want to stand for exactly what you stand for. Fly your freak flag. Let people know who you are. And don't try to blend in. I, I don't mean, you know, wear crazy clothing and run down the street naked. I mean, stand up for what you believe in and let people know what that is. And there's a certain group of people who will love you for it. And everybody else, they were never your clients, your prospects to begin with. So. Mm. Well, thank you, Michael, for being a voice of influence on our show today. Appreciate it. Andrew, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It was great. Thank you.